Now our next speaker is the Cho Yin Lai, and I think he will give you a, a lot of insight to the dynamic of what's going on. It can be anything. Okay, please. Thank you. Well, I'm not really sure what I'll, uh, I should be covering. Like most of what I would like to uh, to present is already covered by uh, my two panelists. Well, both Richard and Siaten has rightly pointed out the political situation in the country right now is quite uncertain, a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity. So that's what we have lived with like for many years anyway. So um, uh, like since they have covered a lot of structural issues, uh, I'll focus on some political actors and some of the issues they didn't cover uh, in detail. When you look at Myanmar uh, the, today, with regard to elections, uh, there are a number of actors who will have to pay attention to, obviously, political parties. Um, may people mainly talk about uh, NLD, USDP, and ethnic political parties, and other uh, sort of opposition parties. As Siaten has uh, correctly said, like, you know, the ruling party, what do we mean by that? Like, you know, jokingly, like uh, in some circle, people refer uh, to USDP, the current r supposedly ruling party, as the ruling opposition party. So they, they like many people, many, many MPs in the, the, told me that the, the time that they, they are all united is the time they all uh, decided to go against the government. Uh, so the, 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 I mean, the, that's always the case. Uh, that's the thing. But the problem with political parties, though, the Richard has talked a lot about it. Uh, but many political leaders, they keep making mistakes. Like if you ask me about three, three or four days ago whether the NLD might win a landslide victory, like, you know, I would, I would just be smiling, like, you know, suggesting that it's not, it's quite plausible. But then, like, uh, they, they have done all the, all the right things that recently. The, the, they went around all the neighborhoods and checked the voter's registration list uh, with people directly, and the, which people really appreciated. And then they were, they, they were helping people uh, the, the, who were not on the list. Uh, the, and then also they invited uh, local constituencies to nominate their own people and then ask all the people who would like to represent an LD uh, uh, like to apply for their, their candidacy. Then like, you know, the, 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 what, this one person I know quite well uh, from the 88 generation, he was asked, he was going to run the election as an independent and then like NLD leaders came and asked him uh, like to, to represent NLD and then like he didn't make the finalists either. Then like, you know, that really, confused many people who were already in the NLD camps. But the, whether this will affect uh, the, the outcome of the elections, uh, still too early to say, because uh, like, uh, the number of these, peop uh, the, these people who didn't make the list are the people who might be able to win the elections on their own. That's still small. But many people who are quite uh, like locally quite strong, but at the same time, whether they can really compete against the uh, like a, I mean, people will be competing against it. And all non-LD, NLD candidates, they will be competing against not NLD candidates, but at the NLD logo and Doan San Suu Kyi in most places. In some places, like if Dosu didn't go to those places and talk to the voters, other bar people, could win quite easily, but at the same time, her popularity is still very, very big. And then, like you know, if she really went around and then mobilized people, it would be difficult for many people, members of other political parties, candidates of other political parties, to win. But the only place where her presence would not make any difference is Rakhine State. Uh, so, like we, I've done. Uh, oh, before I proceed, though. 
I'm here as a scholar. I'm a political scientist by training, and I was a professor before I went back to the country, and then after the elections, I'll go back to teaching. So please don't look at me as uh, like you know, any others, uh, anything other than an academic. I want, to, I want to be able to speak as an academic. And then I've been doing a lot of keeping track of what's going on, and then I've, I've done a lot of uh, surveys uh, in many areas. So, uh, I mean, NLD will do well, uh, but it's not still clear how they would do well, whether they will do, they will do well in Ayawadi, Tanindai, and Kaya. But they will not do well in Karen, Chen, and Rakai, and Shan. But they will do well. That they, they will do well in Kachin, mainly because Kachin political parties are very weak, and then Kachin would not vote for USDP, and then like uh, there the, the, uh, relatively huge Shan population in uh, in Kachin state, but they would not vote for uh, the USDP either. So they kind of they're, they're more likely to vote for NLD instead of voting for Kachin political parties, and then in Mon state. There are some one political parties, but they're very divided. So they kind of um, uh, it's uh, they're so divided that, that, that they, they they are quite unlikely to be able to compete against uh, the NLD leaders. In in other areas like Bago, Mandalay, Magui, Zagai, Yango, uh, uh, like you know, in most constituencies in those regions, it will be really difficult. Uh, for uh, candidates of other political parties to go against the NLD. Uh, is it because they like NLD so much? It's very unclear. As Siatin said earlier, people are very emotional. Uh, the, the, I mean, the current administration, they, they have done a pretty good job in terms of opening up the country. But they, they have also done a pretty bad job in terms of managing public expectations. They raise the expectations, and then, but in terms of, uh, but like, they couldn't really meet the public ex expectation, even though they have done decent jobs in many areas. So the discrepancy between what people think they should be getting and then what they really get is still huge. So the, I talked to some political activists and. Uh, what that they said to me is initially they opened up so they can always the endorse the the government, and then the price was so 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 high. So I asked them what they mean by that. Well, we we'll legitimize the regime, but the problem is, like you know, in return, we didn't get what we thought we would be getting. So the kind of the, 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 that uh, that sort of emotion, well. Uh, lead these people to find alternatives. And then the other non-NLD political parties outside ethnic areas, they have problem with uh, finding uh, good candidates. And also, elections are expensive, and then they don't have much money. So they, it, it, will be, it will be very difficult for them to really have significant uh, uh, effect on the outcome. And another problem with our political parties is uh, the, sh the shortage of politicians. Uh, having lived under different military regimes for many years, uh, we have many political activists. But uh, like uh, the very few qualified politicians. Things are getting better, to, to be fair to all these members of political parties. They're trying to do their job, both in the parliament and outside the parliament. But still, like, you know, to, to keep uh, the reform process on track and also uh, to move forward uh, in a speedier manner, we, we do need more politicians than we now have. And then the, the third thing, thing is we have close to 100 political parties. Uh, like, you know, I ask non-NLD political parties, tell me, why should I be voting for you? Look, uh, I've given lectures uh, to many, uh, the, the, the lecture at many trainings for political parties, and one thing they cannot tell you is, a, uh, like, a clear idea, they don't have clear ideology, they don't have clear uh, policies, even NLD don't have clear policies. I mean, when it comes to economic and uh, the poverty alleviation, uh, but of course they have this brand, Dosu brand, uh, which 
uh, which is more like Mercedes, like, you know, people would want it, like, no matter what. So at least uh, for now. So, uh, but other political parties don't have such brand, uh, like uh, with the exception of some ethnic political parties. So uh, partly because of that, like, you know, whether the NLD will win landslide victory and uh, how will other political parties do, I'll be joining the club of Zertain and Richard. It's still very, very uncertain, but we can only, but we can mainly talk about ethnic areas. In Rakhine State, for instance, regards, regardless of all the problems, our, our nationally, uh, the, the national party will, will win a large majority. It's uh, like we've done that, uh, I've done survey in that state uh, many times. Uh, that, that, uh, and then the main thing is Muslims, they will not be able to vote. Uh, so Rakhines, no matter what the problems are, uh, that they will go for their own polit the ethnic political parties. And there are two, the new political, the Rakhine political party up to this point is not very popular. The candidates are not that, uh, that influential. But the ANP did even better than what the, 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 the NLD has done. ANP, what they did was they basically allowed their members to nominate themselves. But they have their own sort of Burmese, the Rakhine version, I should say, of party primaries. They allowed right, the, the, the members of their political parties to, in each constituency to, uh, to, uh, to no, nominate their own people. To buy. They had secret uh, uh, voting. And then only those candidates who were uh, both, uh, like selected or elected by uh, the members of the parliament would be running. They have done that, uh, that all the candidates they have selected for almost all constituencies are quite strong. But I'm not saying that they will, will they will win 100 percent. But in Rakhine State, they will win quite. They will do quite well. And in Chin State also, Chin political part, uh, political parties that they did something very very unusual. They were like, with the exception of NLD and USDP, they, like uh, all other political parties, uh, had a meeting. They said we should all uh, uh, all be represented uh, in in the parliament. So each party was asked to pick a constituency. So the the, the level uh, that all the like sometimes the level, like uh, there are the three levels of elections: upper house, lower house, and uh, regional parliament. Then they would all run against each other in the constituency, uh, like you know, the, the each party has chosen. So that's also pretty innovative, and they're doing well. And like, uh, I'll, in Shan State is going to be the most complicated place. That is related to uh, the peace process. Uh, the, even though I'm now focusing a lot more on the Rakhine issue, I'm still a director at the Myanmar Peace Center, and and I'm also involved in the peace process. The things are things are not bad actually in terms of the test of the nationwide ceasefire agreement uh, in the last round of the meeting uh, that uh, we discussed uh, 13 points uh, and then the, the both sides reached agreement on 10 uh, the, the three remaining issues uh, they they are they reached their agreements in principle but ethnic the lead uh, ethnic uh, delegations they wanted to check with their own leaders so they went back to uh, to, to Chiang Mai, and then, like you know, had meet a series of meetings on the issues, and the, the, some ethnic leaders met with the pre, both the, with the president yesterday, and then they will be meeting with the commander in chief today. And I all, uh, I mean, because I wanted to come here, so I couldn't be at, at the meeting yesterday. Um, but the the meetings went very well. I talked to, to my colleagues, and then also, like uh, the the meeting that uh, like uh, that will be held on on. Uh, on August 6th, the day after tomorrow, uh, both sides are quite optimistic about it. That they really need to just uh, spend a lot of time on one issue, which is what we call all inclusiveness uh, on the ethnic, on the side of ethnic armed groups who will be signing the uh, nationwide ceasefire agreements. Uh, that uh, the, the, uh, that is it's, uh, the, the one uh, the one main issue they still need to discuss. Other than that. Almost everything else is already resolved. So I would be uh, cautiously optimistic about it. But at the same time, 
I like you know, without this, the, 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 in some areas, uh, uh, this unsettled peace process could have significant effect on elections, not in the entire countries, in some areas, especially in Shan State. Shan State is a multi-ethnic state, and then like, you know, it, it's more like a microcosm of the entire country. That some many political parties, a local, regional political parties, Bao, Palau, and then many others. And so, and much worse, many ethnic armed groups there. Like they have militia groups established both by the, by by both sides. So, one thing is uh, these ethnic groups. Uh, without nationwide ceasefire agreement, we cannot we cannot be sure that they will not do anything crazy. Uh, like you know, they will not intervene. That's one area I would really, if if people ask me where they should got to request in the monitoring, that would be the area I would really focus on. Uh, an ethnic, a member of a leading member of an ethnic political party uh, about a year ago told me, if you think 2010 was bad, you haven't seen 2015 in some ethnic areas. So the kind of, uh, he was worried. So basically he said like, you know, you really need to educate our voters. So the, if, you, if you don't do that, things could get out of control. But uh, the good news is, you know, Richard is right in saying that like, you know, people really, uh, that the, in terms of literal education, quite weak, but compared to, 2013, they're much better. Uh, like you know, a lot of trainings, workshops, and then people are better informed than even 1990. People are more emotional in 1990, but they're still very emotional, but at the same time, they are better informed. Uh, I'm not saying that they're really great, but like you know, they know everything, I'm not saying that. But they're better informed. In that sense, like, uh, 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 in ethnic areas, uh, the ambiguity is there, but it's uh, like, you know, I would not say that the situation is hopeless, but we really need to be careful. But if we uh, we could sign the national, uh, nationwide ceasefire agreement before the elections, that would, uh, that would be really helpful. And the good news is all ethnic leaders, uh, many uh, the media, and then also into the like an uh, outside analysts, you you can only base your analysis on what Jim Scott would call on stage performances. But what I I see is that the difference between on on stage and off stage performances are different totally. I'm not going. To, I cannot reveal more than this. But I I personally witness also since what they would say to the media, and then like you know they would come back and I had to say it. Uh, but, you know, we want peace. These people, like, you know, the, the ethnic leaders also, uh, they understand that the, the civil war, what hard the country, their own areas, their own people, they don't want that either. Uh, the, uh, they might be hard-headed, but they're not crazy or stupid. They really want peace. The same for the government. Like, both sides, uh, like, uh, after more than 60 years, they don't have sufficient trust for each other especially in, in the system and institutions, but they do want peace. The, 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 the army also want peace too. Like uh, what they really tried to do in the closed doors of the, the peace negotiations, uh, the, they try really hard, even with the military leaders. Uh, like, I, I was there, like and how did I, I was there, like in, in each corner. Like one, that, that of course, like you know, in some places, fighting is still going on, and then the ethnic leaders are unhappy about it. But the Tamara leaders and ethnic leaders, like you know, during the break, in, in in many corners, they would they would talk to each other privately, and then try to gain trust from each other. Things are happening in that way. But uh, like, of course, like you know, when you have a lot of ambiguity and uncertainty, people don't want to take the risk. So we'll just have to encourage uh, people in my position if we uh, like encourage them, uh, like you know, to do the right thing for the country, and then at the same time, like you know, we have to be optimistic. Otherwise, we will be if we are in despair all the time. We would not want to do anything. 
So let me now switch to civil society. The thing about civil society is that it's really, I mean, really overly mobilized. It's more like uh, the, the kind of the, the population itself is overly mobilized and that the expectations uh, are really high. And then I don't think even NLD could meet their expectations. But the, thing, the good thing is NLD has taught Dawn San Suu Kyi. Uh, she will have to calm people down. Otherwise, like you know, all of these political parties that, 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 that will have a hard time uh, like, you know, governing the country, like the winning political parties. So they can Richard talk about freedom and governability, and then like, you know, people will always complain about freedom. For those of us who went through the military, the, the, the different military the regimes, uh, the military periods, like, you know, the freedom we now enjoy is, uh, like, in the, according to, at least by the local standard, is incomparable. Uh, uh, I mean, even the media, the restriction on the media, the, the media complained about it. I mean, like, you know, it's a, they have every right to, to complain about whatever they want to complain. But at the same time, even the, like, you know, the, a couple of, uh, a few media uh, people were detained and then they complained. And then, but when you analyze that, when you do the content analysis of the, what, uh, what, uh, what, what is covered in local media, it, it doesn't change. Like they, they, they have become even more, more and more critical of the government, which I think is good. Like, you know, sometimes a bit out of control, but if you ask me if I have to, whether I would choose the media we had before or the media we now have, I would not have a second thought. I would just say, well, just keep what we now have. But of course, like, you know, media people also, they didn't have a lot of experience in the uh, necessary experience either, but they are also getting better. They are learning. So that, uh, but civil society itself and the media, even though they have expectations, they also want to do the right thing. But of course, one thing, uh, the, the state society relations, one they don't really have, a, really have a proper system. That's what's really lacking. What we now have is a good liberal cooperatist mechanism, and we don't have that. But uh, the, what we have is at the individual and personal level, some political and civil society activists, they might know some in the government, or some ministers, and then they, they, they would talk to these ministers and then get things done. But when these ministers cannot help you, then you cannot get anything done. So that sort of situation is quite unhealthy. But would like you know, any future government, uh, they really need to try to create a better mechanism uh, to, 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 to deal with the society. I mean, things like uh, student protests. If they had a better mechanism, uh, like uh, that, uh, we would not have seen that, uh, that there's a huge student protest in the country. Uh, but uh, the civil society, like uh, in the ongoing flood, like, you know, they are all doing the right thing. Uh, they're like trying to raise the, uh, the, 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 the funding. Uh, they all civil society came together, tried to work with each other. But the problem again here is also there's very little coordination between the state and the society. Both sides are doing things separately, and there are a lot of overlaps and stuff. But still, like even in the, the flooded areas, what you would see in the social media, the pictures are quite old. The water has receded in many areas. Uh, in Rakhine State, Chen State, but the problem now is we need to start worrying about Yangon and the Delta area, the areas that are uh, the lower part uh, in the lower part of the country. Um, civil society will be monitoring the, the elections, and that they are going to be uh, very very outspoken. Uh, uh, and the, in the last round of the elections, that is the by elections in 2012. People who violated the, 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 the rules must are NLD sympathizers. I, like, you know, we keep, people keep saying NLD violated rules and regulations, but it is also unfair because many of these people who didn't abide by the rules and regulations, they are, I'm not sure, they are not, they're not, I don't think they are members of the NLDs, but they're just supporters and sympathizers and they are doing things. But uh, civil society watched them but they didn't do much the last time. But as I said, people are better informed. Civil society is better informed. I think that they will do, they will be doing a good jobs in terms of uh, 
uh, bring the, uh, like, you know, ensuring that uh, the elections are free and fair. And then a couple more things before I conclude. Uh, the situation in Rakhine State, I have already said a, a bit about it. Uh, the, the Muslims will not be able to vote. But one thing is, it's a kind of a it, complicated situation. If they know their citizenship status is not clear. But at the same time, like, you know, it's not that the government doesn't want to give them citizenship or anything. That's, it's, the name is not the government doesn't, the problem is not the government doesn't want to grant citizenship, but the problem is the name issue. The government insists on the name Bengali, and then uh, they, they insist on the name uh, Rohingya. And then, like, uh, the, the, there are some, some people in the middle who sort of uh, the, the, want the government to try to come up with a third name. So they kind of, but the right now, yes, it's too late. Too late means if they're willing to take uh, the, the name Bengali, like, you know, chances are th uh, their citizenship application uh, verification would be uh, processed quite uh, quickly. But, like, right now, the situation in Rakhine State is kind of complicated. The people are saying they are confined to areas they are. Uh, and that the situation is bad. Yes, their situation is very bad. Uh, but compared to what was in 2011 and 2013, things are better now. But like when, when we say things are better, I keep ex telling people, like the situation was sort of figuratively minus 100,000. And then now it's like minus 50,000. So the kind of, uh, like, you know, when I say things are getting better, I, 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 that's what I mean by that. But the, at least the government is trying to improve the situation. But, but uh, like you know, both the current and the future government, they will have to try to do a lot more. But right now, the biggest, uh, that like you know, the most both Muslims and Rakhines, they need to be afraid more of their own extremists and hardline leaders than others. Like you know, what uh, like a couple of uh, the last week, a Muslim was killed, not by Rakhines. By the by, uh, the, the, the other Muslims, and then also in other areas, also the things are quite dead. Uh, like you know, uh, Rakhine leaders uh, who are trying to do something, they have to be very careful about what they do too. But all in all, though, in that area, both Rakhine and Muslims, uh, the, the community members, they don't want any more conflicts anymore. So they kind of uh, they are trying that their best to prevent that. The government is also trying to do to prevent the do. But of course, in terms of living conditions, livelihood, a lot more needs to be done. That's for sure. Uh, and then uh, the, the, in the upcoming elections, uh, the thing that uh, the Rakhine will be able to do, uh, uh, the Rakhine political parties, as I, as I said earlier, will do well. And then we, we so the kind of what what would happen after the elections? That's something we'll have to wait and see. For me, like you know, in terms uh, during the time of the elections, I don't really foresee very many problems in the kind state. But we'll have to watch what will happen in the kind state after the elections. During the elections, I will watch uh, that. I, w I would monitor the, the situation in Shan State more closely than others. So, they could, but people would, I think, uh, uh, people, since people are better informed, I just hope that they will do the right thing. Uh, the one last issue I would like to, uh, to, to touch upon is uh, religious extremism, or, uh, or, or, or what uh, the, uh, the issue many people are talking about, the issue of Richard also touched upon. Uh, there's a monk or uh, Sangha organization called Mabata. Very few people really understand this organization. People treat it, uh, uh, analysts and uh, like, you know, Burma watchers, they treat this organization as very homogeneous and united organization, which is wrong. Mabata is more like a network. And then uh, people, members of Mabata, some are very conciliatory, 
They only want to focus on promoting Buddhism within the Buddhist communities. They don't want to get involved in party politics. And then within Mahabharata, the, the, like the Mahabharata as, uh, assemblies and plenary meetings, uh, like uh, their position is not to side with any political parties, but individually that they're, uh, they're doing all kinds of things. Some some are openly supporting USDP, some are openly opposing NLD, and that there are also members of Mahabharata who are supporting NLD. So we cannot really say that, like you know these Buddhist monks are going to create a lot of problems. Like in some areas, uh, they might. Uh, they, they try to influence. Uh, but in the rural areas, for instance, uh, like you know, Buddhist monks in rural areas, the position is uh, uh, quite clear, actually. They're quite smart. The, like Buddhist monks, uh, that so far, that in some areas, I have that, that done research uh, uh, in, they just talk to candidates who would do most for their uh, their constituencies, and then like you know the, that's what I mean by some pe people in local areas are better informed. So the Buddhist monks would not come out and say that they would just support NLD or they would just support uh, USDP. Uh, they just watching who would get them more schools and then who would get that more clinics uh, into that area. So. We cannot say that, 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 like you know, definitely that these monks, the religious extremists, would try to influence and disrupt their 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 role in the elections would disrupt the elections. I don't think, uh, like you know, they were they they, uh, they will the the network itself has a unanimous position that could have significant effect on. The elections uh, throughout the country. Uh, in some few areas, they might have some influence, but in most areas, uh, like you know, it's quite unlikely. Of course, like you know, I could be wrong, but uh, on the basis of the data I have managed to gather up to now, uh, the, uh, which uh, the, it's quite quite unlikely. Uh, and to wrap up. Like Richard and Tatin, uh, the situation in Myanmar is still very uncertain. However, uh, like you know, I for one don't think that there will be a U-turn uh, anytime soon. Like of course, Myanmar is still going through the transition, and uh, 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 like you know, uh, until a country is uh, a consolidated democracy, a U-turn is always possible. But at the same time, like you know, for that to happen, uh, there there got to be. This is purely my speculation. There got to be an all-out all civil war, which is highly unlikely. And then, if some political parties and civil societies gang up and uh, go one against the army, then they're but like you know, which is also hugely unlikely. NLD is very careful about the way. The, 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 the comment on uh, the, the army. So the kind of the NLD leaders are all the, like, you know, they seem to understand that. I cannot be sure, but on the basis of all the comments they have made, they seem to understand that, like, you know, for the stable political transition, they must, well, they, they must have at, the, at least a working relations with the Tamadol or the army. So people, all stakeholders in the country, they don't really want things to go around. Uh, like even though politically they might say crazy things and they might do some crazy things, but uh, deep down they are all trying to ensure that that the things will go forward. So I, for one, remain cautiously optimistic. Thank you. You give me a recipe for disaster because well-informed topics uh, with high emotionally charged and no platform. Uh, I don't want to give you a good example of a neighboring country, so I better not name them. Um, he raised a lot of questions, which I will follow up later on. The role of media you have not uh, mentioned. I think it will be also decisive, just like civil society organization. But uh, I will have a media representative to come in, of all the uh, three panelists that have mentioned. Uh, Gwen Robinson has been traveling to Myanmar uh, very frequently and uh, follow up. Uh, uh, what are your, your takes on all these things, please? 
Thanks, Cody. I'll, um, after that excellent rundown, I'll try and keep my <clears throat> comments short so that we've got time for questions and discussions. I know there was some thought that we might have a short break, but since we've only got a, a little over an hour left, I wonder if people could maybe hold on and, um, and um, think about some of the, the questions you might like to ask after this. Um, also to remind, I think, um, are, we, are we on Chatham House rules here? Yeah. Uh, to mention that yeah. uh, Chatham House rules applies, and if you want uh, uh, comments that you want to call the use, uh, please ask the person directly themselves, please. Yes, I yeah. forgot to say that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, being a member of the media as well as academia, I'm not particularly concerned, but some others might be, so please do check with people if you want to use any quotes. Um, I, so as I said, I'll, I'll keep my comments short, uh, just uh, perhaps um, to add a bit of insight and, uh, and try and draw some of the strands out from the very interesting uh, um, views that we've just heard from our three panellists. Um, but uh, to start with, I've just come back from Myanmar and had uh, a rare interview with uh, President Thein Sein last week, uh, quite a long one, 90 minutes, um, quite unusual. And uh, what was um, most striking, I could go on about it, but you can read it in Nikkei Asian Review. Um, but what was most striking was that uh, unlike previous interviews I've had with him uh, or meetings, um, this time he really spoke like a, uh, a leader who was not intending to go anywhere. He wasn't really making a claim that he would be the next president, and many people think he has no chance, but uh, actually the kind of reforms, uh, the new generation reforms, or what you call maybe second wave or third wave reforms that he was talking about, and the way he was talking would suggest that he you know, was implementing things that maybe he would uh, be thinking he will see through. Um, and uh, whether that's continuing or not, and he made it clear that he was um, he had age and health issues. He was not particularly uh, pushing to go for another term. And as I think Richard explained, it's a complex process that is not up to the candidates to run. You don't run for president. You are chosen in an electoral college system after the election. So even we'll have the election, it'll all go quiet and a new parliament will convene next March. It'll divide into three colleges, upper, uh, well, not really the, the House of Nationalities, which is sort of like an upper house, uh, the lower house of parliament and the military will each vote a candidate, um, but those candidates do not put their hands up, they are chosen. So um, it's, uh, it's really not clear, but I think Tain saying by indicating that he would be willing to serve another term has um, has uh, moved the goalposts a bit on uh, people who expected him to fade quietly. Um, meanwhile, uh, just to review what we've just heard, I think the, the most uh, relevant common thread in what almost everyone, all our panellists said was that really it's just extraordinary that nobody has any idea of how well or how badly the big parties will do, particularly the ruling USDP, where I've heard predictions, like um, some uh, experts are predicting they'll end up with eight seats, which currently they control about 80% of a 664-seat parliament too. So I think um, that's sort of the low end of, uh, of predictions. Others say that the system the USDP has is so entrenched and they've been in power in various forms. They were previously an association nationally of retired military and civil servants um, and very entrenched in local communities. So one cannot underestimate the power of the local political um, allegiances that can, can, can be developed over time. So possibly they could do much better than expected, but right now they're looking like old Myanmar, the associated bad connotations of the dark days of military rule, etc. It's not a good look for um, and the image of these elections, which are supposed to be setting up or consolidating this first phase of new Myanmar and the transition. 
Um, NLD, meanwhile, is riding entirely almost on, you know, the allure of Aung San Suu Kyi, the one um, icon of the party. And as someone has commented the other day, if she was hit by a bus today and uh, the NLD had to go into the election without her, uh, one wonders how well they would do because they are rather faceless. No one can even name who would be the heir if, if suddenly the leader was gone and someone had to step in. So it very much depends on her um, personality and, uh, as uh, Cho Enlein said, uh, uh, what you might call a brand of a party. And uh, she is definitely the brand there. Um, also with the ethnic parties, that fragmentation that, that we heard about. Um, so I think uh, the one thing that possibly we haven't focused enough on in um, the, <clears throat> in the uh, talks was that now that candidate lists are being published uh, uh, for the various parties ahead of the August 8th deadline, which I gather has just been extended to August the 14th, but the NLD amazingly just published all its uh, candidates in, uh, the, I think it's 1009, is it? 1,090, 1,090 candidates. So, you know, the, the others uh, in the coming days, every party and independent will have to declare what, uh, who's running for what seat. Um, so I think given that, we haven't really focused enough on the impact of both the NLD's decision to shun prominent figures like some of the Generation 88 leaders notably um, uh, Coco G, uh, activist politicians and other figures. Also, another factor being the steady implosion of the USDP uh, as, it was, uh, as it was, and these rivalries that have come to the fore, particularly between Tain Sein, who was leading the party, and now Shui Man, the powerful House Speaker. Very, um, very uh, strong hostility there, which is dividing the party quite bitterly. But it's not as simple as that because it's Myanmar and there's various other divisions and factions and a lot of manoeuvring right now and it's not clear at all what is actually happening to that party, how much it will fragment, but it's clearly already divided into two, at least between these two strong figures. And another split you've got at the moment is um, extraordinary hostility which has emerged into the open in the last uh, few months between the military and uh, Shui Man, uh, the, the speaker, who uh, uh, once enjoyed more support and now, you know, there are reports that the military uh, military representatives are actually getting together a petition to ask for the impeachment of the House of the Speaker uh, for not uh, consulting adequately and uh, violating certain election laws. Whether that will happen is unknown, but it's clear that there is a lot of ill will even forcing the Speaker to move his constituency from Napidor, which is heavily dominated by military, to um, Bago region, uh, Bago, which is just near Yangon. Um, so I think these trends, uh, particularly apparent over the last few weeks, are, are changing the parameters and, um, and showing a much more fragmented political scene than we thought it would be even a month or two ago. Um, so what looked like a simple analysis you know, NLD versus USDP, who has the greater popularity, is actually becoming a lot more complicated. So, you know, I'd like to maybe hear uh, uh, some more opinions about that. And um, apart from that, uh, having specialised a little in, um, in uh, the economic reforms, finance, business and investor sentiment, I'd just like to add one more point about the impact of elections on investor uh, sentiment and um, perceptions of business which you know even just in the last six months we've seen uh, step up uh, intense interest in Myanmar initially foreign investors were very hesitant even with sanctions eased um, the US has only temporarily eased sanctions they're not completely uh, abolished so many multinationals are quite cautious and remain cautious um, and uh, they're now much more concerned, I think, about the stalled legislative agenda 
um, because of these elections. And um, the dawning, I think, of realisation that we're not just talking about a quick election in November and everything's back to normal in January. What we're talking about is a hiatus probably from um, probably from the end of this month until probably next June before um, crucial bills that are now being deliberated will probably be passed. And that includes things like a very critical companies law that is going to set some of the, the very much needed uh, ground rules um, for the way companies can operate, particularly given plans to launch the stock market in Myanmar, uh, which was initially supposed to be around now, has been delayed. Everyone thought it would be put off until after the elections, but I just had confirmation the other day that the government is determined to launch a stock market by the end of November, which is just three weeks or two weeks after the election, or early December. Whether that will happen or not, it's clear that the government is very keen to do this before um, before its term officially ends. And its term officially ends on the 31st of January, although the president is overall in charge until March when the parliament uh, convenes. So that's really something to think about, I think. And uh, I do notice a shift amongst investors um, who, unlike in Thailand, where most of them, uh, as you know, have ridden very smoothly through the coup, and despite the fact we're under a form of martial law and generals are running this country, you wouldn't really know it. I think a lot of prominent business will just go ahead and make these decisions about whether they're going to in increase investments or build a new plant or whatever. But in Myanmar, this, um, this uncertainty and the unprecedented nature of this phase of the transition, I think, is making, uh, uh, is making it, some investors nervous. Uh, and you can see this is reflected in things like currency volatility, uncertainty. The chat has has plunged. Um, you know, uh, the chat has plunged very steeply, actually, and uh, other kind of uncertainties that have um, that are often raised uh, by investors. So I'll just leave you with those thoughts, perhaps, and um, and turn over to some questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Quint. Um, um, Two observation. I, I think I read uh, her interview with President Wu Teng saying, I have the impression that the president will come back in the end. Yeah. Yeah, she'll have, he just play his role hard to get. Um, I think he would come back depend on his uh, heart racer as well, I think. But well, but surely that that also depends on whether what, yeah, what sure. parliament, who dominates parliament. That's correct, and yes. And uh, another point is that throughout this uh, discussion, you use a lot of split. In Thailand, you don't use the word split. You use the word diversion, which will lead to conversion later. So I think the, this point you need to consider. I think Myanmar politics is looking like uh, Thai politics 101A. 